Well, thank you so much, Joe and John, for leading us so effectively in song this morning. Always appreciate your ministry. You know, in trying to decide on what to preach on an occasion like this, it's somewhat difficult. When I began the week on Tuesday, I had selected a psalm, the very psalm that we read just a moment ago, Psalm 56. And I spent Tuesday studying that psalm in preparation for our service and then woke up Wednesday morning to the imprisonment of our facility. And even on Tuesday, as I was preparing Psalm 56, uh, even though I was thankful to be in the study and to just kind of be in the normal routine of things, I knew it wasn't quite the right psalm. It wasn't quite the right text. And when they jailed our facility, that confirmed it, that Psalm 56 was not the right portion of scripture. And it seemed to me there was a, another psalm that would be more appropriate for an occasion like this. I think on an occasion like this in times like this, we need to hear a Jesus is Lord kind of sermon. King. And so I'm going to take us into a psalm that we've been in a couple of times in recent years, but I think is incredibly appropriate and really needs no introduction. Turn to Psalm 2. And we're going to begin by reading Psalm 2. And as we read Psalm 2, I want you to consider that as we read it, what we see taking place in this psalm, though it really describes something yet future to us, is a reality in which, a sense in which this is taking place right now at present. Psalm 2, beginning in verse 1. Why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying... Let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, but as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. Now therefore, O kings, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the Son that he may not become angry and you perish in the way for his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. Just an amazing portion of scripture. I've titled this sermon, A Vain Thing. And as many of you know, and even as you can no doubt see as we read through that psalm, Psalm 2, you can really see how it breaks up into four stanzas. And each stanza captures a different speaker. In the first stanza, the nations speak. In the second stanza, the God the Father speaks. In the third stanza, God the Son speaks. And in the fourth, God the Holy Spirit speaks through the pen of David. And I'm going to use the same outline I did previously. We're going to see the defiance of the nations, the disdain of God the Father, the domination of God the Son, and the declaration of God the Holy Spirit. And again, what we're going to see is that what is taking place in the drama of this psalm is really what is taking place at present, both here and around the world. 
And as we come to this psalm and we see Christ high and lifted up, heralded as the King of kings and Lord of lords, may it strengthen us in our resolve to follow after him, knowing that no matter what takes place between now and the end of our lives, Jesus wins. And if you are in him, then you are richly blessed. And so if you're taking notes, jot down first the defiance of the nations. We're going to see this in verses 1 to 3. It begins in verse 1. Why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising a vain thing? The nations are here pictured as being in an uproar. The ESV identifies it as a rage. And this rage has galvanized a rebellion where the peoples are devising a unified plot to throw off the authority of God. The word there, devise, is rendered meditates in Psalm 2, where the blessed man's delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. And so the, the blessed man of Psalm 1 meditates on the, the word of God while the unbelieving nations stew on their rebellion. And though this is framed as a question where you can see that David has said, why are the nations in an uproar? This is not a, a question of inquiry. This is a why with rhetorical effect. It expresses disbelief. And that's because they are devising a vain thing. This is an exercise in futility. How could they attempt such a thing? What complete and utter folly this is that the nations would attempt to put a plot, a plot in place to, to, to rally against God Almighty. And notice how unified this rebellion is. Verse two, the kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. The kings and rulers of the earth have joined forces. This is the United Nations. And what unites them is their hostility to God. They may disagree on everything else, but what unites them and what is a powerful uniter is their hostility against God Almighty. Hostility against God, note this, can make an unbelieving Jew declare that Caesar is our king. That's what happened in John 19, 15. We have no king but Caesar as they cried out for the crucifixion of Christ. And the battle line here has been drawn. It says the kings of the earth take their stand. And it really pictures the nations mobilizing into position. And this on the heels of their counsel, it says, and the rulers take counsel together. They've plotted an insurrection. And they may even think they've done so in secret that they've gone into a, an inner room and in secret plotted some vain thing against God Almighty. Meanwhile, God is ever-present and all-knowing. There is nothing that escapes God's notice. And this stand is against him. It says against the Lord and against his anointed, where his anointed is his Messiah or Christ. So this is an insurrection against God the Father and God the Son. And the aim of this insurrection is expressed in verse 3 where it says, let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. That language of fetters and cords refers to that which restrains. They were literally used on animals to get them to serve human interests. And so the kings and rulers of the earth want to be out from under God's authority. They want to be unrestrained. They don't want any accountability. They want to be free to implement their godless agenda. And notice the pronoun they use. 
Let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. The the fetters and cords of God and his Christ are one and the same. The, The Lord and his anointed are in perfect unity. And so this is a futile effort to throw off the burdensome demands of God's righteousness, to be entirely free to live by their own principle. They disdain the righteousness of God. And they find it an onerous and oppressive thing. Now the seismic and unified scale of this looks future to the second coming of Christ. But but this rebellion has been playing out throughout human history and it's playing out right now. It was playing out in in Genesis at the Tower of Babel. It played out in the life of David and Goliath when the Philistines wanted to wipe out the Israelites. It's been playing out throughout history. It played out in the first coming of Christ when the Lord of glory was crucified even though it was in accord with the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. And it's happening right now and at present. Governments all over the world are counseling together in a unified effort to oppress the people they govern. And in that context, Those who are faithful, those who follow Christ and confess that Jesus is Lord are going to be the ones they have to silence and get out of the way because everyone else is going to fall in line. It's going to be the Lord's people who stand and herald him as king and call governments to submit to him as king and to govern in accord with the very word that will judge them on judgment day. And even as we think about our own government, we have called them to their duty, unmistakably. We have directed them to their duty. They know that they're going to be judged in accord with the word of God, that the word of God is going to be the the standard by which they are assessed and evaluated, and they still continue to persevere in their obstinacy. This is defiance a defiance that certainly climaxes in the second coming of Christ, when Christ will, as we see in this psalm, wipe out his enemies, but it is at work at present right here and right now. Second, notice the disdain of God the Father. This comes out in verses four to six. Verse four, he who sits in the heavens laughs. Now notice, God is seated. He's enthroned in the heavens, which is to say that he's seated above all rule and authority. This speaks to divine sovereignty. The Lord God Almighty is seated on his throne in the heavens above all rule, power, authority, and dominion. And the fact that God is seated in the midst of this planned insurrection demonstrates that God is not concerned. Not concerned in the slightest. This organized rebellion against God is rather insignificant. And that's why he's laughing. And his laughter here is the laughter of mockery and ridicule. God looks down from his throne high above all things and sees this insurrection brewing and he laughs with the laughter of mockery. Second line of verse four says, the Lord scoffs at them. Consider, it is by God's own supreme sovereignty and authority that kings and rulers rise and fall. The rulers that are currently in place are in place because he appointed them. They are accountable to him. They depend upon him for life and breath. He could take their life in an instant. 
No king has any authority but that which is given him from above. Psalm 103.19 says, The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his, his sovereignty rules over all. Psalm 33.10 says, The Lord nullifies the counsel of the nations. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. But you might say, well, just the sheer size of this rebellion. I mean, all of the rulers of the earth, the kings of the earth, like surely the size of this rebellion concerns him. Isaiah 40.15 declares, the nations are like a drop from a bucket and are regarded as a speck of dust on the scales. All of the nations put together are so insignificant, they aren't even worthy to be called dust. They are a speck of dust, a subcategory of dust. And so this is insane. The kings and rulers of the earth are going toe to toe with the one whom they depend on for life and breath. What are they thinking? And notice what starts out as mockery becomes anger. Look at verse five. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury. This anger is completely appropriate because they are coming up against the holiness of God. God is holy. On two fronts, he is transcendent, he is far above all, holy other, none like him, and he is perfect in moral purity. He hates evil, he hates unrighteousness. And they have violated both his transcendence and moral purity. They have treated him like a common enemy and have failed to recognize his honor and glory, and he's angry. The Psalms speak of God being angry every day with the wicked. And in Hebrew, when you put two words like anger and fury together, the idea is to convey a blazing rage. This is a blazing rage. And anger is the Hebrew word for, for nose. And so it's as though God's nostrils are flaring with the intensity of this rage. This is righteous indignation. And again, this should not be a cause for concern that God would respond this way to unrighteousness. In fact, it would be concerning if God didn't respond this way to unrighteousness. This is the only legitimate response by one who is perfect in holiness and righteousness that he would be indignant with unrighteousness. God is slow to anger, but there comes a point when his holiness demands his indignation. And God speaks to them in this anger and terrifies them in his fury, saying, verse 6, But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. What terrifies the, the kings and rulers of the earth is the sovereign installation of the king of God's own choosing. The one identified as God's anointed in verse two, the Lord Jesus Christ. God has consecrated the king of his choosing and they are terrified. Why do you think Herod slaughtered all the babies two years and, and younger when Jesus had come? You say, but the kings and rulers of the earth don't appear to be terrified at present. That's because the kingdom referred to here is yet future. There's going to be a time when the, the kingdom of God comes down. Thy kingdom come. And when that kingdom arrives, it is going to bring with it the full fury of the wrath of God. But even at present, the Lord Jesus Christ is seated in the heavens far above all ruler authority. We saw that last time, Ephesians 1. And there is coming a time when all who oppose him will be judged. And so we need to understand that as this 
Rebellion plays out right here in our own province. Take courage. God is seated. He is not concerned. Enthroned in the heavens, he is high and lifted up. Christ is seated at his right hand, exercising the full reign of his sovereignty over all of the earth. And he sees the rebellion of our God with the laughter of mockery. And he does so because lest they repent, he sees their day coming, Psalm 37, 17. A day that will come with the full fury of God's wrath when the king of his choosing brings with him his kingdom. And that nicely sets up third, the domination of God the Son. The domination of God the Son. It is now time for the Son to speak, and he speaks in verse 7. And here's what he says. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. And so you understand this is a, a conversation, a discussion between the Father and the Son. And here it is. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. And the Apostle Paul connects this statement with the resurrection of Christ in Acts 13, because it was only after his resurrection that he could fulfill God's promise to David in 2 Samuel 7, where David would have a son who would establish an everlasting kingdom. And that's because an everlasting kingdom calls for an everlasting king. And an everlasting king demands that he conquer the grave. The dialogue continues in verse 8. Ask of me, again the father speaking to the son, and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possession. This is a promise from the Father to the Son that the kingdom of the earth, the kingdom of the world will be given to him whereby he will exercise his righteous reign over all things and will ensure that his kingdom is carried out and lived out in righteousness. This is a kingdom that will far transcend David or Solomon's kingdom, one that will transcend all the kingdoms throughout human history because this kingdom will be a worldwide kingdom and will go to the very ends of the earth. And it will be a universal kingdom in that all the nations of the earth will be represented, all those whom the Father set apart as a gift for the Son in eternity past. And again, this one who is both son of God and son of David will execute justice and righteousness on the earth, Jeremiah 33, 14. And David shall never again lack a man to seat and be seated on his throne. You say, well, why does the father promise this all to the son? Why is the son so worthy to receive such a vast kingdom on account of his perfections, his perfect submission and obedience to the Father, his wrath satisfying work on the cross and his gloriously triumphant resurrection from the dead, he is worthy. And so what will happen to those who resist him all the way until his return? Verse nine, you shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. They will be smashed to pieces like pottery on cement. Judged and removed. To see this on the pages of scripture, turn to Revelation 19, where even the same language is used with respect to this rod of iron. 
This is the second coming of Christ. And really is what, what Psalm 2 ultimately pictures. Revelation 19, verse 11, and I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse. And he who sat on it is called faithful and true and in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun and he cried out with a loud voice saying to all the birds which fly in mid heaven, come assemble for the great supper of God so that you may eat the flesh of the kings and, of the, and the flesh of commanders and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of those who sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free men and slaves and small and great. Skip down to verse 21. It says there, and the rest were killed with the sword which came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse and all the birds were filled with their flesh. In fact, even look at verse 19 before that. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. This is what Psalm 2 pictures. And Jesus will return in judgment and all those who refuse to bow the knee to his lordship and look to him for the forgiveness of sin, trusting in his death and resurrection for that sin, they will be on the receiving end of this judgment. And so in light of this coming judgment, we come now to the fourth stanza. It's time for the Spirit of God to speak. So if you're taking notes, jot down fourth, the declaration of God, the Holy Spirit. Verse 10. Now therefore, which is to say in light of this coming judgment, in light of the fact that this coming king will return and will bring with him judgment for all those who reject him in light of that, in light of the futility of resisting, in light of the foolishness of raging, in light of the sovereign installation of God's chosen king and this coming judgment, here is the appeal. O oh, kings, show discernment. Kings ought to be the most discerning men on the planet. And here the Spirit of God is calling them to exercise discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. This is like a, a, a let's reason together kind of moment. Look at Isaiah for a moment. This is a, a let us reason together. This is a, an appeal to think about what you are doing to consider your actions in light of the coming judgment of God. In Isaiah chapter one and verse 18 and following, we see this, this appeal, this appeal and offer of mercy, an invitation to settle out of court with God. He says in verse 18 of Isaiah one, come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow, though they are red like crimson. They will be white like wool. If you consent and obey, you will eat the best of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. Truly, the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Let us reason together. Don't be foolish. Don't spurn reproof. Instead, mend your ways, the Spirit of God says. Make right your past, repent, settle out of court with God and his son. 
Verse 11, worship the Lord with reverence. Give him the honor and glory he's due. And really, even as this is an appeal to the kings of the earth to to, to show him reverence and honor, recognize, kings of the earth, that you are ministers of God, deacons of God, appointed by God to do his bidding. And he has every right as the one who has given you authority to, to judge you in accord with his word. And so the appeal here is to abandon the pursuit of your own glory, to take up the pursuit of the glory of God, a glory that is both sure and delightful. And it goes on, it says there, and rejoice with trembling. What an odd and yet wonderful recipe to rejoice and tremble simultaneously. Verse 12, do homage to the sun. Literally, kiss the sun. In ancient times, when kings and rulers were conquered by another, they would express their humble submission to the conquering king by kissing their feet. And so kiss the sun, kiss the feet of the sun with repentant faith. Turn from your sin and wholly trust in him. And here's the warning, verse 12, that he not become angry and you perish in the way for his wrath may soon be kindled. This is an appeal to recognize the severity of the situation, to recognize the the severity of it all, to cease delaying any longer, to, to, to not go into that hour without the forgiveness of your sins. An hour is coming when your soul is going to be required of you. His wrath may soon be unleashed. And then the promise for all who would come to him, how blessed are all who take refuge in him, who turn from their sin and believe on him. And though this is a warning to the kings and the rulers of the earth, it's a a warning to every single one of us and all who would be in earshot of, of this moment. God is holy and he demands perfection that if you're going to enter into his presence and enter into everlasting life, you are going to have to have a perfect record of righteousness. And what's the problem? That all of us have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. All of us have come miserably short of God's perfect righteousness. And so all of us are justly condemned before God, deserving of an eternity in hell. So what can we do? We can do nothing. God the Father's the one that did something. He commissioned his son. He sent his son to to take upon himself human flesh, being true God and true man. And he lived under the law of God, fulfilling it in every respect. He was obedient in every regard, tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. And in his obedience to the Father, he went to the cross persevering through all of the the physical anguish and and emotional humiliation. And on that cross, the, the full wrath of God for the sin of all who would ever believe on his name came down upon him. He was crushed. The Father was pleased to do so, that he might pardon all those who would turn from their sin and believe on him. And after swallowing the the full cup of the Father's wrath for the sin of all who would ever believe, he died on that cross and he went into the grave and he rose on the third day and he ascended to the right hand of the Father and now the gates of heaven are wide open to all who would lay hold of him by faith and he calls out in this moment through me, be reconciled to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Coming unto Christ and turning from your sin and believing on him will result in you receiving a perfect record of righteousness because you'll be given Christ's record of righteousness. It will be imputed to you and you will stand before God holy and blameless, having everything you need to to, to stand just before him, not by anything that you've done, but by the work of the son. You'll have nothing to boast in but Christ the Lord 
and you will enter into everlasting life so that even if you should die, you can have full confidence that you will live in the very presence of Christ. You just have to know one thing. If you lay hold of him by faith, it's gonna cost you your life. Jesus says, if any man wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Not because doing so secures anything, but because doing so is the evidence that you've truly trusted him. And so coming to Christ is gonna mean dying to self, dying to your own glory, dying to your own agenda, and being willing to come before God with open hands, entrusting everything to him knowing that he is trustworthy and that he is worthy of all sacrifice. And so my appeal to you today is that if you have not believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, that this moment right now would be that moment that you would believe on him. You do not want to go into that final day of judgment with him. He will be ruthless in the execution of his justice. But if you would come to him by faith, turning from your sin, you will have all that you need to be holy and blameless in his presence. Be reconciled to God this day. Let's pray. Well, Father, we thank you for your word and the confidence that we can have because of all that you've accomplished in your son Father, we want you to be glorified and honored. And even as we think of the implications of this psalm for our government and governments all over the world, though we would almost lack the faith to believe that you would work in this way, knowing you can work in this way, nevertheless, we rebuke our unbelief and we pray all the same. Grant repentance to our government. Break through the spiritual death and depravity of their hearts. Open their eyes to see the honor and glory of Christ. And may they in that radiant glory receive life and everything they need to govern in accord with your honor and your word. And Father, for those who are here and still have not yet come to Christ, we pray for them as well. Deliver them from their sin. In Jesus' name, amen. 2 Thessalonians 2, 16 and 17 say this. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who has loved us and given us eternal comfort and good hope by grace. Comfort and strengthen your hearts in every good work and deed. And we all said, Amen. Amen. Enjoy your fellowship. God bless you.